No, we believe that God is a God of all the nations, that God loves all people. <laughs> I'm glad you did the beginning, not the end. That was better. <laughs> better that way. We believe that God is a God of all nations, all people. Around town, around the nation, there'll be celebrations of America and its greatness. But in church, we do something different on this day. On this day, we, we don't pick our nation out of, of, among other nations. But we do remember and we celebrate our freedom to worship. Now, some of you may be like Pretty and me have been to other places in the world where they don't have that freedom. Two of our closest friends right now in Kenya live in a place where, where they can practice their religion, but just a few miles away, if you're a Christian, they put you in jail or they kill you, and you get a reward for that. So today we remember the warrior. We remember the men and women who offer up their lives so that we have the freedom to worship. Any soldier in any nation will fight for their country. But the men and women who put on the soldiers, uh, put on the uniforms, United States military, do something different. That's why my friend Alan over here started to weep as he read, what, read Washington's prayer. The man and woman that puts on the uniform of this country will die not only for their nation, but for an idea. For an idea and an ideal and a concept of freedom for all people. You see, they'll die not only for their nation, but for someone else's nation as well. They fight not only for their nation, but for the cause of freedom. That's why my mother walked off of a farm in Okarchi, Oklahoma to become a WAF. That's why my dad walked out of the high school band at Capitol Hill High School and fought in the Philippines for an idea, an idea so precious that they're willing to shed their blood and even die for it. That's what makes them exceptional. Today we remember the warrior and the freedom they purchase for us with their willingness to serve us, to defend us, and even to die for us. I want to tell you two brief stories. The first one is set a long, long, long time ago when Saul was the king of Israel. It takes place on a mountain, as they call it, called Gilboa. Now, in Oklahoma, we'd call it a mountain too, but the truth is it's really a hill. You think about those little hills as you're driving off 44, just turning towards Mount Scott. Mount Gilboa was about like one of those little hills. And it was there that Saul and his sons and his loyal troops made their last stand. Surrounded by the Philistine enemy, they fought to the death. And when Saul and his sons were dead, the Philistines came and took their bodies to the place you're seeing on the screen now, Bet Shan. These are the, the remains of, of when the Romans had the city. You'll recognize it because... It's the setting for the movie Jesus Christ Superstar. If you watch that movie, you'll see all of this stuff. It's a place I love to take pilgrims to the Middle East. But in the time of Saul and the battle between Israel and the Philistines, it was a Philistine city, a mighty, powerful, and an amazing city. And they took Saul's body there, and they took Jonathan's body there, and the bodies of his loyal soldiers, and they nailed them up on the walls of the city so that they could celebrate the victory they'd had over the army of Israel. You heard the words that Alan read. It said that Saul died there and so did all of his men. The army was decimated. It no longer existed. The Philistines came in and took every city, every village, pillaged, stole, and destroyed. While the body of the king of the Jews hung nailed to their gate. Now there was a little village called Jabesh Gilead. 
I think about where I used to go as a kid in the summer to my uncle's farm in, in Fay, Oklahoma. It's kind of like that in my mind. And there were some guys there who were in the reserves and the National Guard. Farmers, ranchers, weekend warriors. And they thought about Saul's body and the bodies of the other soldiers nailed on the walls of the Philistine city of Bet Shan. And they said, that's not right. It shouldn't be that way. And these guys, weekend warriors, the backup army after the, the professional army had been decimated, they remembered the warrior. They remembered Saul. They remembered their comrades in arms and they set out against the Philistine army that outnumbered them 10,000 to one. And they made their ways to the gates of Bet Shan. And they took down their comrades' bodies and they carried them home and honored them and gave them a military funeral. Now you have to ask yourself, why did they do that? It was a, it was a, a crazy mission. One that could have easily ended with all of them being killed. But it's where that concept that's so precious in the American military comes, not leaving anyone behind. These, these warriors from Jabesh Gilead refused to even leave a body behind. They did it because they remembered the warrior. They remembered a time long ago when they were there in their village and an enemy army had come and surrounded them. And the leader of that army had said, I'm going to destroy your village. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your women. I'm going to kill your children and your grandchildren. And they had called out for help. And no one came. No one except Saul. Saul gathered an army and came and rescued their little forgotten village. Saul offered up his life for their freedom. And so the men of Jabesh Gilead remembered the warrior Saul and they brought him and their comrades home. No man left behind. That's an interesting part of that story. David becomes the king now that Saul is dead. And the very first thing that David does is he gathers the whole nation of Israel together. And there's a lot of things he could say. He could say, you need to be loyal to me. He could say, I'm raising your taxes. He could say, I'm giving you universal health care. There's all kinds of things he could say. But what he says is this. He gathers the men of Jabesh Gilead and stands them before the entire nation and tells them to remember. He says to the people of Israel, he said, to be the best of our nation is to be like these guys, these soldiers, who he calls men of valor. Now that word in Hebrew is a very powerful word, even to this day in Israel. It's an interesting word. It has a meaning you might not expect. The word valor in Hebrew means to love Life. To love life, in particular a way of life, so much that you're willing to die for it. To love life lived the right way with honor, commitment, and faith. So much that you refuse to live any other way, even if it means the loss of your life. David says to the whole nation, this is how you live. This is what it means to be a citizen, to be a part of a nation. To, 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 to live in a nation as a citizen is to be like this, ready to fight for the ideal, for the best of our best, so that it might live and endure. And then David gives the men of Jabesh Gilead a title. 
And I want you to really hear the title he gives him. It's not general or colonel or sergeant. The title is the blessed. Not, not someone who's going to receive a blessing, but someone who is already living in a blessed state. Because David says and says to the people, to live the way these guys live, that is the blessing. To live by honor and commitment and a willingness to sacrifice. Remember the warrior. The second story is about a man named Lou Wallace. I always tell this story in honor of my dad. My dad was in the back lines most of the war, World War II. He got rheumatic fever. He ended up in a hospital. He would never expected to fight, especially not in close combat, but then his position was overran, and he endured hours of hand-to-hand -hand combat just to stay alive. And then it was over, and he never fought again. But those hours, 24 hours of hand-to-hand, -hand, face face-to-face combat shaped him for the rest of his life. So I tell this story in his honor. Lou Wallace was a, was a rising star in the American military. He was a guy everybody predicted would, would be somebody great. He could command the army. He could be a senator or a president. The truth was he never won a battle. He, he had one failure after another. As he, as in the beginning days of the Civil War, the Union Army was a mess. And they had one disaster after another, and Lou Wallace was present for all of them. In fact, when it got to the Battle of Shiloh, which was one of the bloodiest days and weeks in American history, Lou Wallace was blamed for all the casualties on the Union side. Years later, finally, Ulysses S. Grant would admit it was his fault, not Lou Wallace's fault. But Lou Wallace wouldn't live to hear that. He would spend the rest of his life enduring the humiliation of being called the man who caused the disaster at Shiloh. He was relieved of his command of an army. And he was sent to the back lines to count cots and soup pots and ladles and things like that. Until one day, 153 years ago in July, Lou Wallace saved the capital of the United States and the president. Lee had a brilliant plan. He tied Grant's army down. He got them involved in combat that, that Lee knew they couldn't win, but they could at least tie down lots and lots and lots of Union troops. And Grant, as was his nature, Lee knew it, just kept pouring troops into the fight till finally he had just about everybody involved. It was then that Lee released Jubal Early's 30,000 trained, experienced, awesome Confederate veterans on Washington, D.C. to burn the Capitol and to capture or kill Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln himself came under fire and was saved by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Things were so desperate that it seemed for sure the Capitol would fall. Lou Wallace, counting cots, soup pots, and ladles, Remember the warriors. He went hospital to hospital in Washington, D.C., gathering up the wounded veterans of the American army. Most of them were missing limbs, arms, legs. Some of them couldn't walk. They loaded them on carts and took them to a bridge where, where the Confederates had to come through. And there, 2,000 wounded American veterans held off Jubal Early's army of 30,000. These 2,000 wounded American soldiers held the bridge for 24 hours, long enough for Grant to finally send relief and save the capital. When the battle was over, 1,300 of the 2,000 soldiers who stood with Lou Wallace were casualties. 
If you go to Washington today, I encourage you to go see the monument with Lou Wallace that says, they died to save the Capitol, and they did. Lou Wallace never turned his back on his country, even when, when it seemed like maybe his country had turned its back on him. He did what was right. He did what was heroic. He commanded that group of men that came to be known in legend as the Crippled Regiment. And he saved the nation. He went home and he started to write. He wanted to, to process that experience of being a veteran. And, and, and he wanted to, to run through his head what it had meant to be in battle. What it had meant to, to, to put his life up and to see death and carnage all around him. And he, and he sat down and he started to write. And he wanted to write his story. But he thought, everybody knows me as the guy who, who wrecked the Union Army at Shiloh. Nobody's going to want to hear my story. So he thought, what if I, if I took my story and I set it in a different time period? And I kind of disguised it as a little bit. But if the main parts of it were there, I want to tell people what I believe. You see, Lou Wallace was a deeply committed Christian. And he believed that, that when, when life was at its worst, when, when things seemed broken and shattered, that Christ could give you the strength to carry on. It was that great faith in Jesus Christ to reclaim and turn around to life that caused Lou Wallace, who was known as nothing but a failure, to gather those veterans that day and stand on the bridge of monocracy and refuse, refuse to let the capital fall. Lou Wallace wrote his story. And for 153 years, there's never been a day it wasn't being published. It has changed the life of literally hundreds of thousands of Christians. And for 100 years, it was the most popular Christian book ever written. You know it as Ben-Hur. The story of a life shattered and broken and rebuilt by Christ, the story of a warrior who refused to surrender to the hardships of life. When America got into war with Spain, Lou Wallace walked down to the Army recruiting office and signed up and volunteered to serve as a private in the United States Army. He was 71 years old. Today we remember and we give gratitude and thanks for the warriors who have protected us, served us, sacrificed for us, bled for us, died for us, and who still stand even tonight when we go to bed a different post in faraway places, in the dark of the night where none of us would really ever want to be so that we can be free, so that we can worship. So today we give thanks and we remember the warrior. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.